Hey, good evening, everyone. Um, it's March 16th, and I'm trying my third video recording with my little head up in the top. And hopefully this one works out a little bit better. The sound is a little bit better quality, and the video fits a little bit better. Um, tonight I want to talk about the Ediacaran period, which is the interval of geologic time between 635 and 541 million years ago. I mentioned this last time that by definition the start of the Ediacaran begins after the last of the Snowball Earth episode. So if you go back to that lecture, if you look at that lecture, there appears to be two, maybe four, I mentioned this, but at least two Snowball Earth episodes, one at about 750 and the other one that ends probably began around 650 and ends around 635 million years ago, at least according to the most up-to-date geochronology. And following the Snowball Earth episode, some people argue that the Snowball Earth episode is what caused the, you know, the radiation of these Ediacaran organisms. As I mentioned in the last lecture, that seems a little bit of a stretch because, as we'll talk about, that kind of the peak of these Ediacaran was about 70 million years following the, snow, the end of the Snowball Earth. So the, co the connection between the Snowball Earth and the rise of the Ediacarans is a little bit of a stretch, but nevertheless, um, let's take a look at this interval. And one of the unique things is that these organisms from the Ediacaran are, they're somewhat bizarre. We're not quite sure what they are. Um, some of them look very similar to their modern counterparts and other, the others look, you know, quite, quite different. So it may be that they're, might be a unique classification for these organisms and they may be some you know failed evolutionary experiment and it may be something we want to look for um, as we start looking for life on other planets if we think about kind of how we classify modern organisms you probably remember this from high school biology i i, I know that those of you who are biology majors will say the linnaean system is somewhat arcane and that's true However, it does give us, a, you know, a way to sort of sort organisms by, you know, kingdom, phylum, class. So if we if we just kind of go through what a human would be, uh, our kingdom is Animalia, our phylum is Chordata, our class Mammalia, order Primate, family Hominidae, genus Homo, species Sapiens, and subspecies um, Sapiens. So. We kind of classify this, we break ourselves down, and we and we try to figure out where we fit into the overall biological kingdom um, using this Linnaean hierarchy. Um, if we look at the kingdoms, the six kingdoms, there's eubacteria, archaebacteria, protista, fungi, plantae, and, and animalia. That's the, the basic breakdown of kingdoms. If we look within those kingdoms and we look at the multicellular multicellular organisms within those kingdoms, those include what we call the metabionts. Metabionts just means multicellular organisms, and those are the rhodophyta, those are red algae. Um, some of these make calcareous skeletons, the phaophyta, these are brown algae or, or kelp. Uh, Carophytes are green algae, they're a paraphyletic group. Um, plantae are the true plants, uh, fungi, and animalia. So that, again, this is the Linnaean system of classification. It's not necessarily the most useful biological classification system anymore. But when we're going back to the Ediacaran, we're going back 635 million years ago, this somewhat simplistic um, system works it doesn't work, but it's actually a useful way to try to classify exactly where these organisms fit. Now, what some people have claimed is that when you look at the Ediacaran organisms and you try to figure out what exactly they are and where they fit into this Linnaean system, there's considerable disagreement. Are they plants? Are they animals? Are they some unsuccessful evolutionary dead end? And we're going to look at some of these, and we're going to try to figure out, you know, exactly where they fit. And last time, um, 
we did set the stage for the appearance of the ediacaran organisms. And if you recall that prior to the rise of the ediacaran, we had this series of snowball earth episodes. And we talked about it a little bit. We talked about these bottleneck and flush episodes that when you stress an environment, and in this case, it would have been a snowball earth. When you stress that environment, organisms will have to either go extinct or they will have some survival mechanism. By organisms, I mean populations of organisms because, again, a single organism doesn't evolve, populations evolve. So there must have been something that allowed that whatever was alive prior to the snowball to come through, and that caused some radiation event, and then another bottleneck, another radi another. Um, snowball earth episode and another radiation event. So following these snowball earth episodes, following these bottleneck and flush, there we know that life made it through right? because it doesn't appear that life re-evolved. But we start to find these strange ediacaran organisms, and there's a lot of debate about exactly what these are. So what I want to do now is just kind of look at some of the fossils and how they're currently interpreted before we answer this question. I'm going to give you the punchline. The punchline is we can't answer this question. We're not really sure what these ediacaran organisms are. But let's go ahead and look at, at you know, sort of what we know and where we are in this. When we talk about ediacaran organisms, we talk about any fossils, um, we're kind of talking about whether we're, what we're looking at are body fossils or trace fossils. Body fossils represent the preserved imprints of the organism. So when we find a shell, a fossil shell, that is a body fossil. When we find a fossil of a trilobite or when we find a fossil of shark teeth, those are body fossils. Those represent preserved parts of the organism. They may represent only part of it. They may represent the whole organism. But these are the these are more easily identified, right? We we see a tooth, we say, oh, that's a tooth. We see a backbone, we say that's a backbone. So body fossils represent the organism itself. The problem is when we go back to the Ediacaran, we go back to the early Cambrian, a lot of these um, fossils that we find are soft-bodied. So a lot of these organisms are soft-bodied and they don't preserve hard parts. So they're highly unlikely to be found in the fossil record. Instead, what we find are trace fossils. And trace fossils are marking on the substrate, the sediment, um, that are left by organisms going about their daily chores, feeding, crawling, burrowing, whatever. So if you think about these, if you a trace fossil would be a human footprint in the mud. A trace fossil might be the footprint of a bear or it might be, you know, bear scat. You find, you, you know, find excrement of the organism in the woods. Those are trace fossils, right? Because we don't really know what organism left that trace, but we know that it's a biological event that occurred that left that trace fossil. So we're kind of dealing with these two clues that tell us what was going on in the fossil record back at that time. So let's take a look at some of these. Um, here's a good example of a trace fossil. Uh, this is from my friend Steve Hasiotis. And if you look, you can see kind of these sedimentary layers here. But going through those sedimentary layers is this horizontal and kind of infilled with white. And then you can see this kind of white layer down here. Well, what is this? This is actually a burrow. This, In this case, it's actually a crayfish burrow. So crayfish dig holes and they and they go down in there and then the sediment infills, back infills the, the crayfish burrow and leaves this trace fossil of biological activity. Now, if you're just looking at this, you don't know, you have no idea what left this trace fossil, but it's unusual. You see you have these horizontal layers of sediment here and then you have this vertical layer, really white stuff. 
So in this case, it, it was actually a little bit easier because we can look at modern crayfish, we can look at modern organisms, we can see how they burrow and how their burrows are infilled, and then we can trace that back and say, okay, well this looks very similar to a modern crayfish burrow, that's what we're looking at here. And in fact, this is a Cretaceous um, crayfish burrow from in that was found in Antarctica. Um, this one's really cool. It's one of my coolest trace fossils ever. You can see a pen right here. You can see this huge, this is big, right? And these were actually well known in the Western US. People had seen these all the time and they, they had various explanations. These were erosion features or whatever in the sediment. And what my friend Steve, uh, he went and looked at these and he, he is a trace fossil expert. He's hilarious. He's a, he's a crazy guy. We're, we can drive down the road. I'll drive down the road. I used to drive down the road with him. We, we were colleagues together. And he would see a dead deer on the, on the side of the road. And he would immediately stop the car, get out of the car, and go look at the dead deer. And he'd see what was eating it and how far decayed it was and try to figure out, you know, you know exactly what, what process during preservation or death of this organism that this particular deer was. So he has studied all these organisms and he looked at this and he said, well, you know, this is really similar to um, termite mounds that I've seen in Africa, giant termite mounds. And sure enough, as he began to examine this, he could find all the fossilized tunnels of these termites and so forth. So this is actually a Jurassic um, termite mound that's preserved in Western North America. So this is a trace fossil. We don't see any fossil termites here, but we see all the tunnels. We see the business of the term. We see the termites going about their daily business within this fossilized termite mound. So it's quite cool, actually. Um, and at least to me, it is. So we when we look back at the Ediacaran organisms and their fossil record, most of them are soft body. There are not hard parts preserved. Wherever we find them preserved, they're exceptional. Their environments of exceptional preservation. We don't see we don't see teeth. We don't see skeletons. We see imprints of these soft body organisms that are exceptionally pre preserved. So uh, hard parts are quite easy, right? You add tooth, a tooth will last a long time. Uh, skull or bones will last quite a bit longer, but soft parts tend to be destroyed easily. And as people began to look at these and try to classify these Ediacaran organisms, they kind of came up with these general forms. And this tells you how mysterious these organisms are. They would say, okay, these are discoid organisms, or these are frond-like organisms resembling some sort of plant. These are tentaculate disc organisms. So tentaculate means they look like, you know, um, octopi or something like that, had tentacles. And then there were segmented forms, which are more worm-like. So th these aren't described necessarily as particular animals, but by their sh overall shape. So if we kind of go through these and look at them and try to figure out well, what the heck are they, um, here's Dickinsonia. It's a very famous um, Ediacaran fossil. And I just ask you the question. You just think, of, think about it for a minute yourself. Is this fossil discoid? Does it look like a disc? Is it a frond? Does it look more like a leaf? Is it segmented? You know, if you look at it, it does seem to have bilateral symmetry. If this is a central part of the animal, it does seem to have bilater bilateral symmetry across that um, axis. But how would you classify it? Just say it out loud to yourself right now. Is it a disc? Is it frond? Is it segmented? Well, who knows? Uh, <laughs> 
Dick and Sony is known in, known from uh, rocks in South Australia and North Russia. Um, some people consider it to be an annelid worm because of its apparent similarity to a genus of extant um, polychaete called spinther. I'll show you a drawing of what spinther looked like. However, in the opinion of some, it may be a fact, um, you know, a, a, a polyp. So a polyp from a, uh, a coral. It may be a, you know, a soft-bodied version of the banana coral-like fungia. So this is Spinther. This is a modern organism. It's just a sketch of it. And if you go back, you can say, eh, it kind of looks like Spinther. But we, we really don't know. We just know it's a common Ediacaran organism. However we classify or however, however you choose to classify it, you can find scholars, you can find educated paleontologists who have described it as discoid, frown-like, or as segmented. So there's no right or wrong answer here. Um, here's another one called Cyclomedusa. And again, I ask you, first opinion, is it a disc? Is it frown-like? Is it a tentaculate disc? Does it have tentacles? Um, and originally, this was thought to be related to jellyfish, um, although some specimens now hint that this was some um, inflatable frond-like creature, so more a plant-like. Again, who knows? Who knows? This is these are the remnants of these soft-bodied organisms that we find. We don't really we don't really have good hints as to their behavior, as to you know, what they were doing on the seafloor, they're just preserved, and we have to kind of guess at what their, their biological activity was. Um, this one probably is the easiest one to kind of think about. This is called Spragina, and Spragina appears to be a segmented animal, and if you look at it, it kind of has a head. Here's a modern, uh, modern, modern. Here's an ancient trilobite. Kind of has a head. Um, it looks somewhat similar to Spragina. It has these segmented appendages along here, very similar to a trilobite. So there's been consideration, at least, and and some people would say conclusion that Spragina is actually a segmented animal that was probably a precursor to the Cambrian trilobites that came around. We'll talk about Cambrian trilobites in a little bit. Um, Charnia, another bizarre, very, very large um, Ediacaran organisms. These could have been about three feet in length. And people claim, well, these are related to sea pens. And they're the they're absolutely the largest fossils we found, and some of them have been found with the holdfast, which suggests that they were kind of sitting on the seafloor, attached to this um, bacterial mat on the seafloor, and they just kind of wave back and forth as sea pens. Um, and you see these charnia in many, many diagrams of of the supposed Ediacaran seafloor. If we go to um, kind of try to put a geography to this um, and figure out where the major finds of e the Ediacaran fauna are. Um, there are several places where we find really rich, and again, when we talk about rich fossil records, they're called Lagerstata, which is a German word, just means rich fossil bed. And there is a, an impoverished but characteristic Ediacaran assemblage in southeastern Newfoundland in Canada. The oldest um, diverse Ediacaran assemblages that have yet been described are from Mistaken Point in eastern Newfoundland. And these are about 565 million years ago. So think about that. The argument, again, is that the snowball earth allowed created this environment and this bottleneck and flush that allowed the Ediacaran to flourish. And that happened in 635. This is 70 million years post end of the snowball earth. And this is where we find the oldest diverse Ediacaran assemblage. So it's kind of hard to kind of pin the, the snowball earth and say the snowball earth caused the Ediacaran expansion. That's a, that's a little bit of a stretch, and at least in my mind. 
Um, we combined some in England, the Charney and Supergroup. Remember um, these sea pens that are found, found rich sea pens are found in England. Um, but the two most abundant and diverse Ediacaran trace and fossil body assemblies are those from the White Sea coast of Russia and the Flinders Range in South Australia. And the Flinders Range in South Australia is the GSSP, which is a global um, uh, strata point for the Ediacaran. And what that means is um, there were a lot of arguments saying, okay, how do we define the Ediacaran? And in the Flinders range, they put a golden spike and they said, this marks the onset of the Ediacaran period. And if you look at those two fossil areas, those two logger strata, they account for 60% of all the Ediacaran taxa. The youngest of the Ediacaran taxa are found in the Nama group in Namibia, and it's a thick, about three kilometers thick, um, shallow marine fluvial foreland basin succession. It just means it's, it's a deltaic succession. And the age of the Ediacaran assemblage from the Nama group is about 548 to 543. So this is the youngest. So when you look at this, um, the Ediacaran fauna really they do have a they do have a you know somewhat extended interval of existence from 565 to about 543 so about 20 million years where we really see these rich Ediacaran fauna but it's well well after that snowball earth and it's a relatively short period of time and we really don't know what they are um, there are some other Ediacaran faunas notably um, uh, like sponges that have been reported from limestones in um, Mongolia um, and several other places. So if we kind of look at the globe and we say, okay, where are these Ediacaran fauna found? And this is a map that we produced from about 565 million years ago. To give you some idea, here's Laurentia. And you can see all these E's here represent Ediacaran fauna of different provinces. So there are the... Um, E1 province, E2 province, E3. And what we were trying to do with this study is try to see if there was some paleogeographic implications to Ediacaran fauna. That's not important for you. It's just to give you an idea of what the world looked like about 565 million years ago and where these different Ediacaran fauna were found. Um, some pictures of these of these places. Um, this is the Sagana Loom formation. This is the Ediacaran sequence in Mongolia. And this is me, believe it or not. Um, and we're drilling some of these limestones in the Ediacaran sequence in the Sagana Loom. This is Munk Erdene. This is uh, one of my Mongolian colleagues. Um, and we're studying these sequences. If we look, we can see some of the trace fossils within the uh, Sagana Loom. This looks like a kind of a worm-like um, trace fossil. You can see another one here in the C.D. Akron fauna. And then some sort of, it's not very well defined, but you can see this discoid fossil here and another imp very, um, you know, not well defined uh, discoid fossil in the Sagana Loom. It's actually a fairly rich fossil record, but some of the fossils are not as well preserved as some of the others. Um, here I am riding a pony <laughs> in Mongolia, poor guy. Um, just give you an idea. Field work in Mongolia was great. We were there in August and September. Um, this is just before the first snowfall in, in September, and a group of, of um, Mongolians came up and found us as my tent in the background here and offered to give us horse rides. So we, we kind of just had a little fun. Um, this is the Nama group. This is the youngest sequence um, of Ediacaran organisms. Again, I'm just showing you the, the sedimentary sequence here in Namibia within the Nama group. This is the youngest sequence of Ediacaran organisms that has so far been found. There may be younger, but this is, this is the youngest so far. It's fairly rich. Um, this is Mistaken Point in Canada, and this is Guy Darbonne, and below, he's, he's pointing to a golden spike. And so this is one of those global um, strata point sections, and that little red flag, you can barely see it. Below here is Ediacaran, 
and above here is Cambrian. So this is the Ediacaran Cambrian boundary um, in Newfoundland in in Canada, and this marks the boundary between the official boundary between the Ediacaran below and the Cambrian above. And this is the other gla uh, global strata point, and this is these are the Flinders ranges. And again, the previous one was a boundary between the Ediacaran and Cambrian. This is between um, the Cryogenian, which is the Snowball Earth episode, and the Ediacaran. The, the Golden Spike's not shown here, but the Golden Spike is somewhere down in here, which marks the end of the Snowball Earth episodes and the beginning of the Ediacaran period of the Precambrian. Um, when we think about, when we try to think about, okay, well, where did these Ediacaran organisms live? Maybe we don't know exactly what they are, but we can we figure out what their, you know, where did they, where did they, they like to live? What was their ecosystem? Most of them are thought to be shallow marine organisms, although there are a few that may be deep water continental slope organisms. But it's more likely that they occupied several ecological niches, although most of them, to be honest with you, most of them appear to be shallow marine um, nearshore environments. Um, their acme in terms of their largest diversity was around 565. They suffer a major extinction between 550 and 541, which is called the Kotlinian Crisis. And a few Ediacaran organ, organisms survive into the Cambrian, although by the end of the Cambrian, there doesn't seem to be any trace of these Ediacaran organisms. So in some cases, I think Ediacaran is a mis, is misnomer. Um, it's probably incorrect to label the Ediacaran a taxonomic sense. Um, there were probably a combination of organisms that if they were alive today, they would be classified into different kingdoms or phyla. And so I think the best way to at least present is to think about these is that Ediacarans are the best thought of as organisms that lived in the Ediacaran period. And for most of them, we really have uh, not a good clue as to exactly what they were doing there or how they were living. We, we do know that they were living organisms. We're just not sure exactly. You know, it, it, it's easy. We can go out and we can see a tree. We can see a fruit tree. Uh, we can see fossils of dinosaurs. We, we get a good clue as to what their environment was and what ki type of organisms they were, whether they were herbivores or carnivores or omnivores. Much, much more difficult when we go back to the Ediacara. So at present, we just kind of say these are the organisms that lived during the Ediacaran period. Um, again, if we look at a cartoon of the seafloor, you can hear, you can see these sea pens, these charnia, these jellyfish-like organisms. The cartoon of what the seafloor might have looked like in the Ediacaran, we have no idea if that's true. But we, what we do know is that this basal um, sequence on the seafloor was very likely to be um, bacterial mat grounds. And bacterial mat grounds are simply kind of a slime at the base of the seafloor on which most of these Ediacaran organisms lived, um, lived and died. There wasn't much communication um, between these Ediacaran organisms and the seafloor beneath them. 